Welcome to all of you in this audience in front of me and behind me. Uh, our speaker today is Joseph Donner Meyer, um, who is Professor Emeritus in the Rural Sociology Program, which is part of the School of Environment and Natural Resources. He is also a former chair of the uh, steering committee of the Emeritus Academy. His title today for presentation is Who are the uh, Amish and why are they growing so fast? I say Amish because I'm from Pennsylvania. Although much of his scholarly work focuses on the study of rural crime, he also has a deep interest in social cultural, and economic change among the Amish, specifically his research on the demographic dimensions of the Amish, including population growth, settlement expansion, and occupational change. Professor Donner Meyer. Yeah, there are too many people who don't know how to use them. Warm it. Gave the talk at the Women's Club. It's like that. Well, hopefully the technology is working and you can hear me. Okay, good, good. Um, uh oh, I hear feedback. Do you hear feedback? It's not supposed to be on, so it may be the mic that TK is holding. Oh, okay. Let me turn it off. If you've been here for a past seminar and you heard the feedback, it will remind you of the sound that wiped people out in that one scene from Space Odyssey 2001. Okay, but it's still there, but um, I'll try to tone my voice down a little and maybe that will make a difference. Okay, help. How do we get the slide up? Well, you heard the title, who are the Amish and why are they growing so fast? And it is a representation that I think as I get older, I want simple titles that anyone can understand. 25 years ago, when I aspired to promotion, I probably would have titled this The Ontological Dimensions of Existential Change, a Hegelian, a Hegelian perspective, you know, but those days are gone. <laughs> okay. So I have some acknowledgements down there. Um, I often go up to the Ohio Amish Library near Berlin, and I would recommend you visit it because it has one of 10, the Behalt, where the Ohio Amish Library is located, has one of 10 cy cycloramas in the world, only three in the United States. It's 10 foot tall and 265 feet in diameter, telling the story of the Amish. And it's the only one that was painted by a single artist. So um, if you've ever been to the one over at Gettysburg, then you might have a sense of how um, uh, rewarding these are to, uh, to look at. Also up there, you will see the Young Center. I was on a uh, fellowship there um, in the uh, fall of 2022. Beautiful little campus. What a contrast from a beautiful big campus like Ohio State. And I lost weight. The students were so polite that I could have been a hundred yards away and they were holding the door open for me. So I ran to the door just to save them some time. And then finally, there is an Amish fellow. He's a convert. He's a University of Notre Dame graduate named Dave Luthie who for a very, very long time ran a private library up in Elmer, Ontario. And that's where I learned to say to the people at the border, why are you visiting Canada? And one time I said, oh, I'm gonna work at a library. Never say work to a customs person. <laughs> it took 15 minutes before I, managed to get over to, to Windsor and on my way to Elmer at that point. 
but they have been so valuable for the archival work over uh, a, a very long period of time. I probably began this research as a hobby in the late 1980s, but now it seems like it's nearly a, a full-time job, even if I am retired. Yeah, I'm gonna have to be very careful. There we go. I used to use this slide when I taught a course called Ami Society. And I would ask the students, why is this a subculture? What do you see? And they never got it right. Uh, oh, they're barefoot. And I would say, yeah, they are. They're walking to church on Sunday. It's a family. Oh, and they're dressed funny. And I said, ah, now you're getting closer, but it's not funny. It's, um, it's their culturally defined dress based on their religious values. But the real marker of a subculture is sociological in this. It is the fact that the children are dressed identically to the parents. Now we look at college students at The Ohio State University and say, how many of you dress like your parents? Several yucks and, uh, you know, and things like that. And I go, okay, that's the point. This is socialization in visual form. Let me show you this and then I'm gonna repeat it. Those are the communities as we mapped them out in 1970. And we'll go to 1980 and you might begin to notice a few more dots and uh, you might notice a little bit of a regional expansion into the South. And then we go to 1990 and you see some more. Then you see 2000 in Kentucky and Missouri are really beginning to fill up. And now look at 2023, we're gonna skip 2020. All of the stars are new ones. All the way out to Idaho, Montana, there are a couple that can't even be shown on here. They're in Prince Edward Island today. Uh, you see one right on the edge on the far east side that is, well, you may not with that sign up there, but it's New Brunswick. There's one on the border with the U.S. New Brunswick. In fact, the farmer who works the field on the Canadian side waves to Homeland Security all the time. <laughs> so you can see there's, there's just so much growth that the Amish are becoming a presence now in 32 states, four Canadian provinces, and there's one in Bolivia. That one is a conservative Mennonite group that decided the Mennonites down there were getting too progressive and they were put under the supervision of bishops for a probationary period and they're now considered Amish. So here we go again. You might wanna pick out a state and just watch what happens, no matter what state that happens to be. There's 1980. 1990, 2000, 2010, and finally, once again, all of the stars of recent growth. Now, I should point out, and maybe on one of the slides, that the Amish are growing so fast that their doubling time, the time it takes to double the population, is now about 20 and a half years. So that's pretty fast. In fact, that's one of the fastest growing populations in the world today, especially for a religious group that does not depend upon proselytizing. But it isn't just procreation. It's more than that. It's socialization that counts. So the Amish can be defined as a rural located subculture. And um, that one picture on the right is a picture that I took at the Kidron auction up in Wayne County, Ohio. I took it because the two buggies there are different styles. But I realized that what I had was a subculture surrounded by us, cars on one side, and is that a hog or a motorcycle on the other? But there it is. And that's what subcultures are. They're not separate, but they are distinctive. They're surrounded by the main culture. And you need to keep that in mind uh, all the time. Um, so a subculture, if it's the last, has to 
sustain itself. And that means socialization does become the primary uh, function. How does that happen? And so let's go on. Oops, come on, let's. Well, suddenly nothing is working. Do we have a tech person here? Ah, there we go. Now a sect is a religious subculture. And someone who throws rattlesnakes in their church service to be saved, um, it's, it's a Christian group, just like most, just like the majority uh, or the largest group in the United States. The Amish are too. The difference is the Amish are communal. In fact, every once in a while I get a something from somebody who would say they must be damn communist, which is completely false, but uh, they're not individualistic. They're not going to have overt displays of salvation. You are saved by participating in the community and the life of the community and obeying the rules and regulations of the group to which you belong. So they're very group oriented, very communal. Now, I'll give you the five minute history of the Anabaptist movement. First of all, the Protestant Reformation comes along, but there was a group in Zurich that thought that the Lutherans in particular really just looked like Catholics warmed over. They still had infant baptism, and that isn't right because you go back to the New Testament and it should be adult baptism. And Therefore, they symbolically rebaptized themselves at a particular place in Zurich. I got to get there one of these days. And uh, there's a picture of Bahalt up there, by the way. To remember is what it means in Pennsylvania Dutch at the Amish Mennonite Heritage Center. And there are people in there looking at the mural. The, the, the painter actually has a style that is reminiscent of El Greco, if you know who that is. So one of the things that is going on here is that it's called the Radical Reformation because, you know what? I'm going to digress here. The key is this thing. I stepped away from it and the echo stopped. So I'm going to stand out here. Okay, good. Okay. Um, baptism, infant baptism was used for tax purposes back then and was also used to have a role of eligible males for conscription. So when you go to adult baptism in the 1500s, you're directly opposing whatever government happened to exist, Catholic, Lutheran, whatever, back in Europe at that time. So it didn't take long before persecution began. In fact, the founders, the four people who rebaptized themselves symbolically as um, adults and therefore became known as Anabaptists, they were all dead within about three years. The only one who wasn't drowned in a river or burned at the stake uh, died from um, the plague while sitting in prison. So they were gone, but the movement spread. This was during the time of the Peasants' War and other things and down the uh, uh, Danube and up the Rhine, this Anabaptist movement sp spread no matter how much uh, authorities wanted to squelch it. And so um, a lot of them were put to death. You see there a picture of a book called The Martyr's Mirror. It's about 900 pages, and it reads like a Stephen King novel in describing the martyrdom of Anabaptist. And there are a couple pictures that eventually got illustrated, and you can see a couple pictures here this guy is being hung by his thumb with a weight on his foot while the jailers play cards. He'll be put to the, he'll be burnt at the stake the next day. And this one up there, which often is mistaken as a picture of a witch burning, is in fact an Anabaptist woman uh, in the Netherlands who was slow burned. See, they have a ladder. So they move you over the flames until you're screaming at the top of your lungs, then they move you back. Then they put you over the flames again. 
and that's their way of night you know the good old days were, were old they weren't good all the time and this is a case of that and so uh, there's about 30 illustrations in the book and almost every Amish family has one because they read about the martyrdom of their ancestors and so when something like the Fillmore County Minnesota um, prosecutor um, tries to um, arrest Amish because they don't have septic systems, they remember that this is nothing compared to what our ancestors had to go through. And uh, so it's very much a part of their socialization and their culture today. Now, back then, if you were being persecuted to that extent, you did not have a church building. Hi, Anabaptist, Sunday service, come arrest us and boil us in the oil or something like that. You went out to caves and in the woods, you hid and you had a church service on Sunday. And the Amish maintain that today. They don't have church buildings. There are a couple that have meeting houses, but there are particular circumstances for that. So like all new religious movements back then, you grab something from that big book called the Bible and that begins to define your lifestyle. And in this case, it's to be separate from the world, which both of those verses uh, emphasize to one degree or another. This is a St. James uh, version of the translation, by the way. Uh, the Amish have had for a long time a particular adherence to the St. James version, probably because to get over to the United States through the Netherlands, they had... Uh, um, basically rely upon the goodwill of one of the English kings at that time. Now, not too long after all of this began, there was a group that in 1534 decided that Jesus was coming back in the city of Munster, Germany, the New Jerusalem, and they took over the town. And they immediately made everyone get baptized. So it wasn't voluntary anymore. They made anyone who stayed that was Lutheran or Catholic to get baptized in a Baptist. There were so many more women than men, they also decided polygamy was a good thing. And um, about a year later, um, mostly a, Catholic, a major Catholic military force took the community back, killed the leaders, and hung their bodies in iron cages from St. Lambert's Church. And if you go there today to Munster, beautiful little city, by the way, those, those cages are still there. The bodies aren't, <laughs> but the cages are. And so uh, it's a little bit of a kind of a history and there's a good restaurant nearby St. Lambert. So, <laughs> okay. So at that point, what a disaster. And there was a former Catholic priest who became Anabaptist named Menno Simons. And he started writing down what it means to be Anabaptist, because after all, most people didn't read and write back then. And so a lot of them acquired the nickname Mennonites. Then about 150 years later, after things settled down and the persecution began to die down, there was a bit of a, um, a schism. There we go. I must be, my apologies if I'm hitting the wrong buttons here, but there was a, um, a division in which the leader of the conservative group was named Jacob Amon, and that's where the nickname Amish comes from. And you can see where he was born in Orlenbach Simital in the, what is today the Canton of Bern. And that white speck in that photo is where he was baptized as an infant. That's the church. But then later on, he joined the Anabaptists, moved to Alsace on the French side, which was very German speaking, and uh, then led a schism. And they got the name uh, Amish. Now, I'll tell this because it's a real life story. I was speaking to a group and I could tell that the woman was quite angry. And she raised her hand and she just, and she pounded on the table, you know. You can't name a Christian group after a human. And then she said, I'm Lutheran. 
And then almost like an old Saturday Night Live with that one woman that went, never mind, right? She realized what she said. <laughs> so I didn't have to reply or get defensive in any way. <laughs> so how many of you are Lutheran out there? <laughs> no. Okay. Now, to sustain itself, you got to have a way of passing everything on, your, your behaviors, your beliefs, your values, everything. And that, again, is um, a, a kind of um, sociological discipline to do that. And so um, the Amish um, basically have a set of characteristics. The outer characteristics are things that tourists go to, a horse and buggy, uh, farming, although they're not in farming the way they used to, plain dress, uh, Pennsylvania Dutch language, which actually uh, the researchers now would say is an American language, not a German language. It's an, And in fact, one person wrote, it's an American language made from German parts, which I think is a great way to describe the synthesis of how it came about as Germans moved especially into Pennsylvania and then he gradually, as everyone became assimilated, about the only group left speaking Pennsylvania Dutch or the Amish. And so that happened. So how do you do this? Because the Amish have been quite successful, and they've been quite successful, especially in the 20th century, actually post-World War II 20th century, and this century. I mean, rapid change. There are sociologists who write about liquid modernity, not just modernization and change, but continuous, constant change, like liquid poured down rocks, like a waterfall. And um, they do it in a couple different ways. And this is probably the key. And it's the key to the inward part, not the outward part of their society. And this is the late John Hostetler, who was at Temple University. And he wrote about the Amish Charter. And the Amish Charter is the following. Basic to the Charter is the maintenance of small scale and rational, and those are my words, I added in rational, way of life, something that you calculate and you um, live by. Uh, this comes from my background in sociology where people like Peter Berger or Rosabeth Cantor wrote about intentional communities. This is, so the Amish are not traditional. In fact, they may be more modern than us because they know exactly what they're doing. So here are some inward traits. No church hierarchy, no cardinals, no pope, no nothing like that. There are about 3,000 church districts. Each one has a bishop. One or two ministers and a deacon. There may be two or three dozen families. No distance whatsoever between, between you and your religious leaders. And each of those three, deacon, minister, and, and bishop, have various responsibilities for caring for that church district. Um, the services are rotated from residence to residence every other Sunday. That compels you to live close together you have to get in a horse and buggy, especially on Sunday, and get to everybody else's residence. And kind of the rule of thumb is a four, no more than a 45 minute drive by buggy on Sunday. And the leaders are selected by lottery in accordance, in accordance with the Acts of the Apostles where Judas was replaced by Matthias. They drew lots. And so what the Amish do is men get nominated. You must have at least two people nominate you. And if you aspire publicly to be a religious leader, you'll never get nominated. Too much pride. So keep it, keep it. And with two, that means it's not just your spouse. By the way, this is a patriarchal society. So the men are the, the leaders. And um, what you do then is you get three or four men nominated. They walk out of the room. They assemble four Bibles, and somebody writes on a piece of paper that passage from Acts of the Apostles, puts it in one of the Bibles, shuffles them. Men walk back in, whoever picks up the Bible, 
is now going to be ordained. No formal training whatsoever. None. And then finally, there's a church discipline, and that can be pronounced several different ways, but ordnung. Otning is the other way. And it is reviewed twice each year in what is called the gross uh, ordnungsgame. Now, again, if you have a social science background, you recognize a German word called Gemeinschaft. And that is a short form of that word. It's spelled different ways. You see G-M-A-Y and G-E-M-E-E. -E, but it's Ordnungsgame is when all of the baptized members review their discipline. Twice a year, they review it. That's why they're modern. And that's why they're rational. And then they have communion. And communion is about right now by the way. It's usually, uh, we had an early Easter, but it is about Easter time. And uh, so they, you have the, uh, what's called the gross gamay at that point, where, and you have foot washing, one of the few groups that actively do foot washing. So that's kind of a, a background of what's happening with the Amish. And they do adjust their rules. For instance, I wish I had had the, uh, wisdom about 10 years ago to set up a solar panel franchise in Holmes County, Ohio. They adopted solar panels faster than anyone. I'd be wealthy. I might even donate some, <laughs> but um, oh, fabulous. They're now adopting electric bikes up there to the extent that there are now Amish families without a horse. They get around completely by electric bikes of various kinds. As long as it's not a gas combustion engine. And so far, the churches have not, in reviewing their church discipline, said, sell them off, get rid of them, put them down. This is not Amish. By the way, which they did about, about 1920 with automobiles. Amish were buying up automobiles and tractors. And, and the, uh, the churches back then said, no, no, we won't have a sense of community if we can drive that way instead of ride a buggy this way. Hence, what they did was um, some of the groups actually broke off. Some are called beachy Amish today. They allow car ownership, but they're not counted as Amish on my maps or on my list. So why the population growth? Why the settlement growth? And the reason is going to be basically two things, high fertility and high retention. The second one has to do with lifestyle and socialization. The, they are a pronatalist group. That's kind of a phrase that's used in some demography areas. And there are a number of religious groups out there that um, you know, go forth and multiply and, and all of that sort of thing. And the Amish are that. I'll show you the numbers 5.8 to 5.1 is sort of my composite estimate from various sources of the 600 plus communities of the number of children born to a couple if, when they were married. And you can see that there is a slight decline, but you know what? In 1890, it was about six. So it's required that should say 2024, it's required 130 years to decline nine tenths of a child. Wow, well, that's not very much. And how do I know this? There's one back on the table, but I'm going to show you the big one. This is the Holmes County Directory. Okay, look at the size of that. This is a New York City phone book. Inside are a listing of families. And you can see that a couple might have, you see a lot of children listed. I know you can't see specifics, but you can see the structure of the, of the thing. And that, that shows the number of children when they were born. And I can use that to calculate um, the number of live births during a, uh, the period of a woman's fertility, which is up to about the age of 45. Demographers either stop there or at the age of 50. And as a criminologist, I also have a measure of deviance from this. You know what it is? 
I have the marriage date and I have the date of the firstborn. If the firstborn's within seven months of the marriage, the couple probably wasn't paying attention to what the rules were. <laughs> now they'll still get married and everything is okay, but um, it is uh, a measure of deviance and about 8% of firstborn Amish children are born or are conceived before marriage but only 8%. So it's pretty good. Okay. But I do kind of track that because it is a measure of how strong that church discipline applies to the next generation. Okay. And the retention rate, you see back in 1890, it was below 50%. Well, think about your lifestyle in 1890 compared to today. It was easy to slip over because everyone drove a buggy. Everyone read a book, read their King James Bible by uh, oil lamp. And there was always a small town where you could go for all of the needed services. It was much easier back then to slip out and marry, you know, if you're an Amish boy, you, you know, your eyes begin to twinkle for a, a nice looking Presbyterian girl or whatever. And and so um, the, the dropout rate was much, much higher. But over time, as we adopted cars and electricity, and of course, it's being yoked to the utility company that the Amish object to. I often get people ask, they don't use electricity. And I go, are you kidding me? If it's a battery, they use it. You're autonomous. If it's a solar panel, you use it. You're not connected to a utility company. So over time, um, our social change has helped their retention rate get higher and higher. So what happens when the two come together? High fertility and high retention. You get a doubling time of about 20 to 21 years. And that's where the Amish are today, growing quite rapidly. So why retention? Okay, let's go into that. Yeah, I think you know why high fertility. I think, you know, we all have children, so we know what that is. But um, let's think about this in terms of retention. First of all, in 1972, this is when the population boom kind of begins. The Supreme Court ruled that the Amish are exempt from compulsory education and consolidated schools. And so before that time, almost all Amish children went to a small rural school with Amish and non-Amish, and likely the teacher was not Amish. Now the parochial school movement begins, and you're in a and you're in only with Amish children, and highly likely an Amish teacher. Think about that in terms of socialization. It's shifted major time. And by the way, the teacher is not certified today. Usually it's a 19-year-old unmarried girl who has a reputation for knowing how to enforce discipline. Once she gets married, she's not a teacher anymore. She's a homemaker. Again, this is a patriarchal society. So we got that going on. The Amish shifted. I don't think when this happened, no one anticipated what that meant sociologically for their population increase. It was simply resisting um, our laws about consolidated rural schools. I al always tell the story, I, I started at Purdue University, and Bernie, you know this, when there was, um, um, Hadley was his last name, um, who was out constantly, he was an agricultural economist, I was in that department, and was constantly talking about how schools need to be more efficient and consolidate. And of course, that was for all rural schools. I, I forgot his first name. Do you know it? Yeah, but uh, he was quite a proselytizer. And of course, he did not know that there would be implications of this for a state, Indiana, that has quite a few Amish. Now, here's the other thing. They have a multi-bonded lifestyle. What does that mean? Well, look at this slide. We're over here. You know, I spent my, well, 35, 
plus years at Ohio State. And um, I had a lot of friends. You know, we'd go to the varsity club, places like that. But none of them, my colleagues, live in my neighborhood. I think maybe one might have gone to the church my wife and I went to. You know, they're separate groups. If you're Amish and you're in that small scale environment, the person you work with, kids, go to the same small school that your kids go to. You all belong to the same church and you live maybe a couple hundred yards up and down the road. It's multi-bonded. Amish often talk today, they have fun doing this because they like genealogy. If, two, if a couple gets married, they calculate whether it's a double cousin marriage. That is, they're, they're second cousins. I'm sorry, second, double second cousins. I shouldn't, no first cousins. But how many different ways can we calculate that your second, third, or fourth cousins because of the intertwining of genealogy over time? And uh, it's a big part of how I, I've sat in a room with Amish people talking about genealogy and I'm lost. I know they're talking about it. But, uh, oh, yes, my neighbor's grandfather was the great, uh, great uncle of your first cousin's son, like that. And um, it'll drive you crazy if you try to follow it. You just nod your head. Okay. So because of that, the Amish population today is almost 400,000. By 2050, it will be close to a million if current trends continue. Meanwhile, 678 dots on those PowerPoint slides. And they're growing as fast as the population because the, of the pressure on land and the expensive land in places like Holmes County, the big communities, Geauga County, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Elkhart, LaGrange, Noble County in Northern Indiana and Napanee up there. And so they're beginning to spread out all over, taking advantage of rural uh, de-industrialization, that is of cheaper rural land prices in many parts of the world. For instance, they're beginning to move into West Virginia quite a bit and, uh, and other places where actually poverty rates are fairly high. Sometimes they actually turn around the population. Uh, they just moved into a county in Nebraska called Valentine County. It's almost the size of Connecticut. It's so big. And I think um, with about 10 families, they will double the size of the township. Now, here's a definition of a settlement. I know there's a lot of words, but this is from that Dave Luthie who I acknowledged at the beginning. And it's this, because he came up with the definition. And it's a, he is not a sociologist, but I can't think of a better sociological definition of a community. It requires at least three families. See that? Formerly active settlements are not included, and if the community grows, then it will sustain itself and get bigger and bigger and bigger. If not, one of those families moves and it's no longer a, a settlement. They must also identify as Amish and their church discipline, their ordnung, uh, does not allow automobile ownership. So for instance, there's a community in Oregon that started out, Mc, McNinville, that started out Amish, but they adopted cars. They're off the list. At that point, they're beginning to drift over to a more mainstream type of church. So we use that to track communities. And you'll notice at the bottom, it says, this not only includes old order, but there are conservative groups, more conservative than old order. Troyer, and Trooper, there are probably about 25 that all have nicknames. And some of them are hilarious. For instance, the Nebraska Amish that drive white buggies are located in central Pennsylvania. It turns out when they decided to identify separately from Old Order, one of the leaders formerly lived in Nebraska. So they acquired the nickname, the Nebraska Amish. But they're in Pennsylvania. 
of all places. Okay. And there are also some progressive groups, New Order Amish, and there's even an electric Amish group that allow electricity in the kitchen. And they're much more uh, progressive. But the Ordnung is powerful. The church dis is powerful. I know somebody who was interviewing an Amish family, and um, she mentioned that um, someone in New York uh, she talked to was using a power mower, lawnmower. And the fellow she was talking to got rather upset by it and said, we would never allow him in our house because we only have push mowers and that's too far, too much for us. And uh, so these, this hair splitting creates identity for uh, these groups. Now, Ohio hosts 76 communities today. And I mean, this count is up to March 31st, 2024, okay? And you can see the other big states that host um, uh, Amish communities. Uh, there's one piece of really good news here. At least we beat Michigan in something. <laughs> but all of these states um, below Ohio and, and Pennsylvania, just a few years ago, had single digits playing host to communities. And today... Look at that. These are the number, I think, that have 50 or more. Montana has 12. I never would have guessed that when I started doing this research. Maine has 10. And they're all founded in the past 15 years. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. My wife, Diane, and I were driving out to see our son and daughter-in-law in, in Hood River, Oregon, and we decided to travel through Nebraska in Wyoming, after all, we wanted to see Yellowstone and all of that. And, but ah, near Devil's Tower, what a great name for an Amish community to be near. And um, we stopped to see if we could find the new community in the first one in Wyoming. There are now five. And um, it's near Devil's Tower in Crook County, which is another great name for a religious group. And we saw a sign for Crazy Lady Realty which has nothing to do with the real estate agent, but everything to do with the creek that it's next to. It got the name Crazy Lady. We drive in and we knock on the door and boy, were we lucky. They sold the Amish the land. And since there are no road signs on the gravel roads, we got precise directions. Of course, I still got lost. But there was someone following close behind me and I pulled over to let them by. And of course they rolled down the window and said, you're not local. All right. Well, we have an Ohio license plate. That that helps. But what are you looking for? And we said, we're looking for the Amish community near Hewlett, Wyoming. And they said, oh, I'm driving out to make potato soup with one of the Amish women. Follow me. Well, we got out there, spent part of a day with them. Um, I got to do all the grunt work. They weren't just making potato soup for a family of seven, but for a whole community. I was lifting sack after sack of potatoes from the trunk. So you can see how it's increased over time. Um, let, me, let me read you something. I, I kind of checked uh, this morning. This is the number of communities founded since 2017. It, two, 2017, I did a presentation for the Emeritus Academy. So I use that. In 2017, there were 19 communities founded. In 2018, 20. In 2019, 27. In 2020, 26. In 2021, 22. In 2022, 20. That all this? There'll be a quiz. Okay. In 2023, 26. And already this year, we have two more. And if things continue at this pace, we will break 700 by the end by December 31st, or be very close. So for the Amish, when they move to a new space, they have to recreate place. 
And historians will sometimes call that a chain of migration. That is, especially in terms of immigrant studies. You know, you, you bring over your culture and you set it up again at the new space that you're in. And I think if any of us here grew up uh, in a big city, like, you know, I, the high school I went to was uh, on a hill called Spaghetti Knob. You can pretty well guess who first moved there. Uh, we have German Village down here and all of those. And so those were places where immigrants began to establish themselves as the next generations began to assimilate. The thing for the Amish is, is that their multi-bonded society is so strong, the kids are not assimilating. They are simply getting baptized Amish, doubling the population, and by 2050, we may have as many as 1,500 communities. And I bet Ohio is, will be the first state to break 100. Now, here's the caveat. Why do you start a new settlement? Not only population pressure, but there's land prices. Maybe you want to stay in agriculture and you can't afford to buy land at 50000 an acre in Holmes County and make money. Uh, maybe you are concerned about the Amish way of life and those electric bikes, et cetera, and you want to renewal. You want to go back and, and do it a little bit different. And because there's no ecclesiastical hierarchy, there's no church authority to tell you you can't redefine your church discipline. So you have a renewal movement. There's one in Caneyville, Kentucky like that. They want to go back to more um, uh, traditional technologies. Uh, there was one down in Tennessee for a while um, that would only use steam power and manual labor and animal power. No fuel whatsoever. Don't know how they did the steam, though. Okay. And, of course, a desire for outreach. Now, a lot of the bigger settlements sponsor sister and daughter communities, and they share the same discipline, at least for a while. And um, so there's literally these, it's almost like if you can imagine string theory from physics, there's these strings of similar affiliations that their tentacles are out there all over. Uh, the uh, North America. Now, there are four stages, and then we'll get to questions. One is ex exploration. Some people get in their head, it's time to start a new community, and they begin to land shop. Prior to land shopping, they may gather together as much information as they can about temperature during the seasons, rainfall, type of soil, everything, um, timber, can you start a sawmill? I've been in a bishop's house near Mount Elgin, Ontario, a very conservative group. I'll tell you how conservative. Um, bathrooms are inside a house are only for women. The barn is for the men. How's that? Would you love that lifestyle? <laughs> anyway, um, they had 500 pages of computer-generated bar graphs of the natural environment. Where did they get these? Very simply, a neighbor with a computer. And they studied and studied and studied, and now they're in a part of Manitoba called Vita, or Vita, uh, Manitoba, which is just about 20 miles, 20... 30 kilometers north of the U.S. border. Um, maybe they're going to look at the town nearby. What kind of services? I had an Amish fellow from Bell Center, Ohio, as I was driving him back from a conference, and we were at, um, I think, McDonald's, and he just wrote down on a napkin, I still have a napkin, here's what we want in a community, a grocery store, a dentist, a doctor, a post office, and on and on like that. And then he said, and within 10 years, we lost almost every service in that town. 
And this is Bell Center, Ohio, if you know where Bell Center is. And so now they had to hire a van driver to take them into Bell Fountain, Ohio, where they get those services today. Um, land purchases are made and sometimes plots are subdivided. There's a community in Southern Colorado that bought a large beef operation with um, the technology to feed the beef. Um, and there were six pivot operations, pivot, with about 100 acres each circle. And they bought the whole thing and then immediately subdivided it. So six families had six pivots. And they did other adjustments for who got the main house, et cetera. And so suddenly we got six plots of land. We can stay small. And we have a kind of a critical mass to where we can begin to nominate and have our own minister and our own bishop. So that's sustainability when that happens. Um, here is a stage two in terms of announcements. This is from a periodical and I have a set of them back on the table. And I just had one delivered in the, um, yesterday, I think in the mail. It's an Amish periodical. There are several called the diary. And in this are reports from about maybe 400 communities a lot of communities have a volunteer scribe and they report on things happening in their community. Most of it's pretty boring. You know, I saw my first hummingbird, things like that. You know, they might announce a, a, a birth. Um, and as a criminologist, sometimes I get stories about crimes that have happened. Somebody broke in our house when we were on, at church on Sunday. I've just published two articles on that. No. Finally, I got to combine the two things I do in my career. But um, um, I just turned to Litchfield, Kentucky, and it's 46 degrees after a week of sub-zero weather. Heard of some uh, a little, heard of some a little lower, had lots of green to freeze by it. Now the pasture is already greened up again. Isn't that exciting? We have plans to go see what to do to deal with some land out in central Kentucky area tomorrow. I'll likely highlight that when I do my research because that might mean they're gonna sponsor a new community, but they're looking for land. So there are some back there, I got my scribbly notes on them. This is a clean copy. And it, it says the diary of the old order churches, a contribution of the church for the church by the church in the interest of collecting and preserving its historical virtues. And this is a way that all of these 678 communities can keep in contact with each other because there is no ecclesiastical hierarchy. So the information is spread horizontally, not vertically. And this is a key to doing that. Stage three, you begin to recreate that social and physical structure. And you'll see up there, I have another diary quote from Prince Edward Island. First of all, they're referring, you know where church is gonna be because you see a wagon parked in front of a house like that. Usually it's parked about four or five days before the Sunday service and it's a bench wagon. And it's where all the benches, the Bibles, everything are stored and even the plates and the utensils for the fellowship meal afterward. So if you're driving up in Holmes County or Jalka County or an Amish community and you see that wagon, it's likely that is where the church service will be. And look at that quote. They get to Prince Edward Island about, oh, about um, uh, 10 years ago. And immediately their first task is to men make the benches, the women varnish the benches. And now we're set. We need that. That way we can all gather in the barn or in a house and have our church service and have uh, the, the physical infrastructure for it. By the way, an Amish church service is about three and a half hours long. It's in Pennsylvania Dutch and you will struggle to stay awake. And if you're a guest, they put you in front next to the leaders. So it's really visible when you fall asleep. Um, men are on one side, women on the other, except for little boys in diapers. And uh, so it, it, it's kind of set up like 
a shaker service would have been at one time. And so you, you get all that, but this was a community project. It wasn't just buying benches, it was building them. As this community moved out of Ontario, 800, 900 miles to Prince Edward Island. There are now two communities there. And then to, to top it off, Prince Edward Island is the location for what set of novels? Yeah. Um, what were they called? Uh, what was the name of the... I just forgot too. Anna Green Gables. Thank you very much. Yeah. And Kings County is where they're located. And talk about change. If you were there in 1999, it was Anna Green Gables. Okay. And then a group of Buddhist monks moved in with about five, 600 followers, all dressed in red. They go buy lobsters and then release them back into the uh, water. Then six years later, two Amish groups show up. <laughs> And so it's a very much more diverse county than it used to be at one time. Okay, then you have first events, first birth, first marriage, first death, on and on like that, all of those first. And uh, first day of school, first Christmas program. Whatever, whatever it may be, you get all of this stuff going on, and uh, it's it marks the beginning of the history of the community. And then you get sustaining a community, and this is a good example. This community is today about hillside is about it's in southern Colorado. It was about eight years old, and they had their first wedding. But look at the number of people who came to the wedding. We got van loads coming in from here, there, a bus, and on and on. All of this it represents extended family and friendships from the places where the first families uh, came from. And they all arrive and have the wedding. I don't know where they put up all of these individuals because it's traditional for the Amish to put up uh, visiting families. And this, this community probably only has about 20 families. I don't know where they put everyone, but actually a lot of times the, uh, the children, especially the ones that are over the age of 10, bring tents and they camp out in the barn, which they love, you know, getting away from mom and dad a little bit. Um, oh, I'll point out something that, see that picture? That's a Swiss Amish group. They don't speak Pennsylvania Dutch. They, they come from a, more of a Swiss speaking area. They're more conservative and they don't think buggies should have tops. So umbrellas become important. Volleyball is now the sport along with baseball because it's team oriented. Fits right in with the culture. I love this one, example of Amishizing. There's gonna be some sort of a motor rally and hey, sell some cookies, right? Did you recognize the uh, McDonald's sign? You see why it's up there as an example of Amishizing? You know where that's located? You can get a picture of it yourself. That's Sugar Creek, Ohio, on the east side of the Holmes County community. Yeah. Well, the fellow is a, or the woman is a good business person. You know, they set the drive through window for buggies, the height for buggies, and then have a place where the buggies can pull in. It's also um, a cultural window. And here's what I mean. I uh, probably could think of it a different way, but we'll say cultural window. On Friday or Saturday, some of the more rebellious girls will drive and park their buggy in the McDonald's parking lot, go into the women's room and change in the blue jeans. <laughs> and then they will go to a bar. And then at the end of the evening, they go back, change, go home. So it's like a portal from one culture to another. 
So here are the concluding remarks. Is there a danger with this gigantic growth that it's going to be disruptive in some way to the continuity of Amish social patterns and, and cultural patterns? And my answer so far is going to be mostly no. And here's why. As long as there's no shift to a hierarchical structure to their religion. Oh, let's, you know, have 50 bishops under the supervision of a super bishop. No, that's not going to happen. As long as they stay away from that, and we have about 3,000 autonomous church groups that review their church discipline twice a year and are relatively autonomous from each other, then it will, it will work. Second, as long as the church districts remain small and don't get any bigger. There are a couple that are quite large. They have decided that um, we don't want separate church districts. There's, I think the largest one though, and some of you may belong to a, um, a mega church, but the largest Amish church group has 75 families. That's a mega church for the Amish, okay. So it's really kept small scale. It's that Amish charter. Third, the development of new settlements provides a safety valve for this continued population growth. Also presents more economic diversity for opportunities to do a business. The Amish are down now to about 17% of the men farm. So uh, carpentry and sawmills are outpace farming at this point. There's even several Amish men who list themselves as Maytag repairmen. If you remember the old Maytag commercials where the guy sat in his house and never got a call because they're so reliable. Okay. And finally, as long as visiting occasional conferences of bishops from the same variety of Amish. Um, circle letters. You know what those are? All of that is horizontal communication, not vertical. Here's what a circle letter is. A, and it, it, this is really valuable. It is a letter where I decide that I want to start a circle letter group, and we all have something in common. Uh, let's say um, we're all highly intelligent and handsome. So I'll start that one, okay? Now, I send it to the next person in my group. He or she either writes on the bottom of my letter and adds to it or adds a second letter. Pass it on to the third person. And maybe in about a year, because uh, there are a lot of handsome, intelligent people, it'll, it'll all come back to me. And I'll either pull my letter and add a new one or um, I'll keep my letter in there, but I'll add a new one. And then I send it off again. And some of these circle letter groups are up to 50 years old. What a valuable sociological thing that is for uh, a subculture like the Amish. Ah, we're back to the family where the kids look like the parents. Okay, so uh, do we have time? How much time do we have for questions? Ah, <laughs> okay, I like someone who takes charge. Good question. Um, medical care in the Amish. Uh, first of all, with the experience of COVID, the Amish actually became more resistant to vaccines than they were in the past, although they always have been more resistant for vaccines going back to uh, tuberculosis than um, anyone else. But they seem to want to rely upon alternative forms of medicine, um, but they are self-insured. There's the deacon is in charge of collecting money from the family in the same church district so that if there is a medical need, a need for um, mainstream medicine, they have a fund of money they can use to take care of 
of whatever the condition of an individual is. So they are more than happy to use medical services, but they prefer to use alternative sources first. They're cheaper. I, I would uh, point out a couple experiences of mine with that. And when I was in medical school in, in the 70s, we had one classmate who was Amish. He had been selected in eighth grade um, because of his intelligence and photographic memory, and they funded him to go on to higher education and medical school, and he ended up going back to that community. Uh, we also get Mennonite applicants a lot who want to take care of people in the Amish community. Yes. Uh, no, and we pay attention to that, particularly at Ohio State, because we know we know. have a large Amish and Mennonite community in Ohio. And hospitals near Amish communities will um, really go out of their way to be friendly places for Amish uh, because it draws in so much business. The Amish often pay cash and there's much less paperwork. But you do mention something that is also um, part of the situation of medicine in the Amish. And that is there's an underground medical establishment with the Amish. Uh, sometimes they're just called reflexologists. But there are people who will pull teeth, uh, act like a, a chiropractor. Um, there have, uh, of course, midwives, but most of them follow the state laws, but not all the time. And so there is a little bit of an, a gray area in Amish relative to health beliefs and relative to uh, use of medical services. And sometimes that shows up in a, a, a headline in the newspapers. Where do they get their money to uh, to fund or to buy new land? Dave, you have a good question. Where do they get the money to fund all of this? Well, in response to the population growth in a lot of areas, and Holmes County is a particular case, successful business people contribute money to a fund. They, they get, I think, a 2% return, uh, interest return. That money is then made available to new families to buy land in a house or to start a business. You have to be a relatively new family in good standing. And so it's an investment in the next generation. The last th time I heard, the fund up in Holmes County had close to $100 million in it. By the way, there are a lot of Amish millionaires nowadays, in part because of us tourists but also because furniture making, sawmill, and a lot of traditional manufacturing is now um, uh, businesses that the Amish occupy. And so they're doing quite well economically. Although not all, but you know some. So we're gonna start with William and then go over, I think you raised your hand and then we'll go to Walt Roth in the back. So when you showed your uh, development through time of the of the geographic spread of communities, Illinois was almost didn't change at all. Illinois is almost still empty. Uh, is there a reason you can put your finger on for that, or is the land too expensive? I'm I'm going to try to go back to it also, and we'll put a map up there. But yeah, I think there is. First of all, in the early part of the 21st century, Illinois was a place to go especially Southern Illinois, and then it stopped. The reason why Illinois is um, not likely to grow fast is that the cost of the prairie land um, uh, foregoes um, expansion through a lot of the state. Uh, so they're all down in uh, uh, Southern counties. And uh, that has happened in a number of states. New York, is that's occurring right now. New York was the go-to state for about 10 years. Now it's slowed down in part because of some of the state Supreme Court decisions about schooling for conservative Jewish children in New York City. And that controversy and those decisions have impacts on Amish parochial schools. And so the Amish suddenly I noticed 
there were four or five new communities per year in New York. And now I thought it was gonna, they were gonna surpass New York, uh, Ohio. And now uh, I think there've only been two communities founded there in the past five years. So there can be legislative obstacles as well of some kind. Now it may start back up again. Maybe land will become favorable again in terms of the pricing. Um, and there are enough Amish communities down there that word of mouth about land and prices and availability and assistance to unload new arrivals at a new community are there. So it, it could start back up, but for right now it isn't. So next question over here, I'm gonna turn my back and try to get a map up, okay? Oh, what happened? This, okay, you're gonna you're gonna try to get the PowerPoint back up. Okay. Yes. As the Amish community is horizontal among the Amish, how do they interact with local governments? You described how they respond to court decisions. The what, what do we say the yes. judicial branch in the legislation that's enacted by these states. How do they? How do they interact with government? Do they vote? Do they? Do they? They vote? tend not to vote. Um, for a national election, it might be ten percent of eligible Amish vote. They are targeted now by the Republican Party in Pennsylvania. But um, and if it's a close election, it just might make a difference. But no, the Amish will stay away from voting. Uh, most of them consider Donald Trump immoral, and most of them consider the Republican Party immoral. How's that? That's bipartisan. Uh, in other words, um, abortion on the one issue is a big deal for them, which drove them away from being sympathetic to uh, Democrats. But then also, the uh, why would we support someone who's behaving like he does? So they, they tend to stay out of it. But there are some examples of Amish who do vote, and when they do, it's Republican. Do they hold office? Do they compete in local communities? No, no, they, they did before the Civil War. Back then, there were county commissioners and superintendents of schools, and, but not, not anymore. They don't do that. Now, what happens is, is here are two cases, Kenton County, Hardin County, I'm sorry, Hardin, Kenton, Ohio, and uh, Fillmore County in Min Minnesota, both of those communities are dealing with regulations about septic systems right now. So that's kind of a local county thing. There was a aggressive prosecutor in a county in Kentucky who decided that all of that horse poop when the Amish came into town was awful and he began to try to put them in jail. The Kentucky state legislature then gave the Amish an exemption on that. There was a time when Jolga County was trying to make the Amish horses wear diapers. Well, that every Jay Leno on late night talk show were making fun of Jolga County. And so they backed off of that. And, you know, and so these little flashpoints occur. And often in areas where the Amish are new, and local officials don't understand the society and the culture. Those flashpoints might briefly happen. Thank you. Yeah. Now, Rolf, you had a question back there. How much of a problem is the fact that they are closed breeding communities? in terms of genetic diseases that have a much higher incidence when you have such a, yeah. a closed interbreeding population? My guess is, this is about uh, genetics. My guess is there are about 15, maybe as many as two dozen identifiable diseases that are related to uh, genetics among the Amish. Um, and it all goes back to the original immigrants in some way or another. Uh, the population today really did come from a relatively small genetic pool. Now, on the other hand, there are more and more groups of all kinds, but especially the medical profession, 
that now have clinics where there is genetic testing and research of Amish and, well, and conservative Mennonite and other populations that have had um, a restricted, a shallow gene pool, if we could put it that way. And uh, there's one up in Jalga County right now. There is a rather famous doctor named Holmes Morton from Lancaster County who really helped, is a hero among the Amish because there is a disease called, and I may mispronounce it, and you can correct me, glutaric aciduria. And it is a protein deficiency, if, if I recall correctly. And it's triggered by a cold. So an eight month old baby will begin to show spots. And authorities were thinking this was abuse of a child. And he came along and he said, no, this is not. The, the, the external symptoms are not what we think. It's, it's a genetic disease that goes back to a single family that came over from the Rhine River area through the Port of Philadelphia. And at that point, the um, arrest and jailing of Amish parents stopped because it, it was something else. So he became quite a hero. And uh, he continues his research today. And there are now also several other clinics that deal with diseases that are um, more frequently expressed in Mennonite and Amish communities. Are there restrictions, for example, between first cousins marrying? Yes. There weren't back when there weren't for all of us in the United States. But second cousin marriages are still quite frequent. And that, uh, so that is a, a kind of people assume that it's a bit of a myth nowadays. And my response always is, well, before the Civil War, it was far more common among both Amish and the rest of society. And it is no longer uh, common. And in fact, it's amazing what you find out. I'll, I'll do a little confession here. I was sorting out pictures at home and I came across a holy card from a Catholic funeral mass. Part of it was in high German the other side was in English, and it was for someone on Diane's side of the family with the last name of Wesley, and she died in 1915. And I think that's why the card was saved. It's so old. And I look at her maiden name, and I go, well, that's my mom's maiden name. I call contact the first cousin who does genealogy, and she said, you mean in, you didn't know after 51 years of marriage that you two were second cousins? <laughs> so I guess we're ready to join the Amish <laughs> at this point. But yeah, it, 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 double cousins, uh, you're almost related to everyone else in some way if you know your genealogy sufficiently. Could we pause to see if anyone on Zoom has some questions? I saw at least one in the chat. Oh, yes. From Gregory. This question. Hi, Joe. Yeah, uh, I was just curious I whether him, COVID yeah. had a particular impact on settlement not. patterns or population numbers. Are you able to hear me? I think he's asking about COVID and its impact on the growth of settlements did slow down during the early stages of COVID because of restrictions on travel, but it didn't really have much of an impact. There was a, a, obviously some research on how do we educate Amish about this and get them to do vaccinations. There are some communities that are quite resistant. I know of a community, I know of a, an individual who is in a community, a smaller community here in Ohio, who did get a COVID shot. And almost immediately, he was visited by a very angry Amish woman who now claimed he was going to go to hell, that he was now an agent of the devil. Well, that's a lot of peer pressure, isn't it? And um, uh, so there is that kind of resistance. But frankly, I don't think, Greg, that it has really impacted them in any way. It's just another 
um, story in Amish uh, reluctance when compared to the mainstream to use vaccinations. Uh, there are still Amish today, and I'll read it in this um, diary that will say, send our children to school today because one of the other children had whooping cough and we might as well get them all inoculated. You know, the uh, herd vaccine, I guess, is what you might call it. And so you, you still have that kind of mentality uh, among the Amish. So um, it, there, it, their medical beliefs and their practices are a real hybrid of mainstream medicine and subcultural uh, patterns. We have another question in the chat. Okay, and then we're going to go to these two individuals. Well, we'll alternate and then we'll get these. I read a report recently that said the Amish are considered the healthiest in the world. Any insight into this? I would disagree with, with that. Yes, they are healthy. For instance, uh, the journal I edit just received, I just received a manuscript in which the life expectancy of Amish men 25 years and older, that is, you know, you start looking at how much longer they're going to live, um, is nine years higher than what the National, National Institutes of Health have for the general population. But we haven't had it peer reviewed. So, you know, we need to be careful uh, with that one. But um, I would tend to think that's true. What happens with the Amish, and I'll mention this on uh, grandparents, is they have what's called a dowdy house. And the dowdies are like grandparents. And once they get to a certain age, they will sell their property to one of the other adult children who may already be married or will soon be married and start a family. And a house will be built next to the original house. And that's where the grandparents live. So it's called a dowdy house. And so the idea of going to a, um, a retirement village is not part of what they do. And so they're enmeshed in this same multi-bonded society well into old age. There are very few Amish that you would find in a old folks home or whatever we, we want to call these things nowadays. And so they're getting visitors all the time. If one of the elderly is very, very sick, there will be the community will organize visits and baking meals and do. And some of us, of course, live in environments like that ourselves. But nonetheless, the the Amish will specifically do this. This is an important community function for them, and I think that helps extend longevity to some extent. Uh, and, and it'll be interesting if the article that was just submitted this morning uh, talks about the cultural patterns or just sticks to the statistical differences. We'll find out. Okay, so there are two hands raised and then you are next. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'm interested in sort of the the historical preservation of records in archives and um, you mentioned the diary, which was interesting, and circle letters, um, and genealogy, which it sounds like is to an extent preserved orally. Are there, um, and is there a discouragement actively of individual writing of, of, you know, so interior life or the preservation of that? No, there is not an objection. There are a number of Amish who will write diary-like books and They'll get a couple hundred copies printed and, and sell them to extended family or in their community. Genealogy books are published. If you go up to Behalt near Berlin, Ohio, you can buy a genealogy chart. It's about three feet by three feet, kind of in a circle, and families use it to fill out their genealogy. This is all very, very important to the Amish. There are even Amish, if you want to be a tour director, who now, if they're allowed by their church discipline to get on a plane, will visit all of the sites back in Switzerland and Alsace and along the Rhine River, Palatinate area of Germany. So, um, and they're visiting, and they even have tours of extinct communities. By the way, there's 678 
settlements, there's also been 240 failed attempts. Often, most of those were before World War II. And uh, there will be um, tours where you go to places that still have evidence of the Amish being there, such as an old cemetery. And now, one other thing, if you go up to the Ohio Amish Library attached to Behalt um, and see that nice cyclorama, and you may see me in the library, they have digitized a number of the Amish publications. The budget, which is out of Sugar Creek, Ohio, is digitized all the way back to its first edition in 1882. And so I can now do a digital search, a search of communities. I just type in new settlements and let her run. Sip a little coffee and then take notes. And then back there, we have a gentleman who has a question. Do they know how much, because they, ha they have to uh, expand with new communities and the new communities need money, and because they are so, well, limited in the amount of medical uh, treatment that they use and also old age loss of money. Is there any idea as to how much they spend on medical as opposed to the general population? Because it could be an incredible savings for them. I am not aware of a study that has specifically looked at that, but my educated guess is that it's per capita much lower than the uh, the regular population, the mainstream population. And my other question is, are there any Amish communities who are now saying, well, we don't need to have land, but we could all be carpenters and still live in a, a so we wouldn't need all the land, but we could live close together and all be carpenters. Yes. There are a number of communities that no one farms, none of the men farm. And you're right, all they need then is about five to 10 acres for that horse to hitch up to the buggy. And uh, they're kind of like Amish acres, Amish suburbs. You can, you can see it. They're rural areas that are incredibly densely populated for being rural. And um, a lot of the Western communities are exactly that. It's sawmills that provide the economic opportunity for them. Thank you. There's someone over there first, and then we'll go to you. Okay. So you mentioned the number of people that might uh, leave uh, that way of life. Have there been many examples of people who did not grow up Amish who entered the community? People who um, convert to the Amish faith are called seekers. And there are probably about a dozen every year, not many. Coincidentally, the two I know the best both grew up in Upper Arlington. <laughs> they should have seen each other at the Barnes and Noble bookstore, you know, or whatever. But then one's in um, Ohio and the other is in Maryland. I know both of them. And, and what happens when you leave? What happens with your relationship okay. with your family? Yeah. First of all, it uh, let me go back to your first question. It takes about three years to acquire the language and the lifestyle. So you're sort of under a probationary period. And probably the success rate of someone trying to convert is less than 50%. There are a lot of people that go, oh, 21st century hippies, I'm gonna join. And then, you know, it doesn't work out for them. Um, now, onto your, um, your other question, it, it depends on if you're baptized or not. If you are not yet baptized as an adult, then you are not um, violating a sacred oath you took to abide by the order. And so it's easier to maintain the relationships with your family and former friends. If you are Amish, you've been baptized, and then drop out, the shunning can be more complete. But it really depends on the behavior that you exhibit that determines uh, what a family does. And also, is this a conservative group or a less conservative group? I mentioned the lawnmowers. If 
I'm in the Nebraska or the Troyer Amish and I decide to use a lawnmower, I will be probably um, excommunicated and people may not talk to me all because I have a Briggs and Stratton, which seems trivial, but for them it's symbolic, symbolically important. So that's what happens. By the way, most youth who do not decide to be Amish end up as another Anabaptist group, conservative Mennonite, um, mainstream Mennonite, beachy Amish, um, brethren, old German Baptist groups like that that all have roots that go back to the original baptism in Zurich in 1525. One more? <laughs> okay. I don't know what time it is, so we can do two, three more. What is the language that they are speaking most of the time? Is it Plattdeutsch or is it English or is it a mixture of Plattdeutsch and English? It's not Platt. They wouldn't call it Plattdeutsch. Uh, that, that is more conservative Mennonite. Pennsylvania Dutch would be considered a little bit different. However, amongst themselves, it's going to be Swiss or Pennsylvania Dutch or, Platt, or Plattdeutsch. But when they interact with us, it will be English. When they read in church, it's high German. So some Amish actually know three languages. Um, one of the functions of parochial school is young people grow up in a Pennsylvania Dutch environment. They know a little bit of English, but the parochial school was to get them to learn the English so that they can go out into the world and be successful. That is successful as Amish people. It's a bishop until he dies, isn't he or not? Yes, a bishop can is a bishop till he dies, passes away. But there are retired bishops. There are bishops that are no longer able to um, complete their duties, and the church will make them bishop emeritus. <laughs> so maybe he can join the academy, and then they'll go through the nomination process and selection of a new bishop. So there are uh, probably one out of 15 church districts that have a retired and a full-time bishop. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the quality of the questions. I wish I had had you in class 11, 12, 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs>